her a tremendous career boost, and he became her campaign manager in her political campaign. They went to Mexico on a number of occasions, uh, occasions when the FBI, who was taping everything he did and said on a daily basis, decided to conveniently not tape during those trips. And essentially, they decided they were going to do whatever it took to put her in a compromising position. And even that witness who they tried to hide outside of the state, who I had the judge order in as our witness, admitted that it took about a year to get her to start taking money. But unfortunately, she did take it, and she took it for approximately a year, and she made statements that were rather incriminating, and she was convicted of some counts and not others. But then, the question, why take the case? I took the case because I thought what the government had done was absolutely outrageous. And I felt they had never done this in any other predominantly white community that I ever heard of. I took the position they would only would do this in a poor African American community. I took the position that they thought they could get away with things because they had devalued the people in that community based upon race. I raised an entrapment defense. I also made a motion to dismiss the case based on selective prosecution because of her race. Now, in the middle of this investigation, and there must have been over 600 surveillance tapes in the case, I had about 50 boxes of documents, I found one tape, I'll never forget it, late one evening in my office, a Saturday night, I'm bleary-eyed from just sick of listening to tapes. I mean, I listened really to, to all 600 of them, most of them audio tapes. I found one that didn't seem, seem rather strange. Um, I figured out, finally, that the two FBI agents, both of whom were white, and the chief government foreman, who was Armenian, did not know the tape recorder was on. And they were waiting for my client to show up for her first payment. And it was just a remarkable tape, because it was so different from any other tape I had heard. And at one point, the Armenian informant said to the two white FBI agents, you know, this is a crazy case. They're greedy. Every black one's coming from everywhere. We'll put she and the mayor, who was black, on ice, and then we'll get another one. That's on the tape. Now, was that tape enough to exonerate Ms. Moore in front of this federal court jury? It was not, but it was certainly enough to expose racism in a government investigation, racism in the way they prosecuted the case, and it was enough to really send an embarrassing message to the government, if you try this kind of stuff, you're going to be exposed for what you are. Okay, so she was convicted of some counts. She got a very minimal sentence. I'm convinced it had a lot to do with what we exposed in the case. We also found a letter written to the head of the FBI by the informant that essentially was complaining about blacks getting away with things in Compton uh, and essentially was, from my point of view, had a clearly racist message in the case, in the, in, as far as he was concerned and had a race, formed a racist motive for what he was doing in Compton as he tried to help the government take down black politicians, okay? There's a case where I found evidence of racism and I screamed from A to Z about the government's racism in the case. I felt it really was something we had to raise, and I felt it was something that had to be exposed. Now, a couple of years later, I handled a high-profile criminal case in Los Angeles. It was not pro bono. I represented a fellow named Larry Carroll, who was a prominent newscaster, had been for about 30 years in Los Angeles. He's African-American. He and two other African-American men were indicted by a state grand jury in San Bernardino, California, which is outside of Los Angeles County, for securities fraud. And basically, some scams had been put together. They were quite complex, and they were fraudulent. And the prosecutor, who was white, decided to only charge the three African-American men who I discovered after my investigation were really victims of the scam and not perpetrators. In fact, my client had put his own money into the investment, and there was evidence that he was told he had a big return coming, and commissions were promised to the three African-American men who were charged. If you listen to the tapes, the investigatory tapes, it was clear that the people who put these scams together were white. It was clear that white men had conceived of the entire way of presenting these scams so that almost anybody you know, on surface at least, who didn't know much about it, could be taken. 
I discovered there had been a meeting of the International Chamber of Commerce in Hong Kong the year before where bankers and representatives of sophisticated financial institutions around the world had got together to talk about this problem, these types of frauds proliferating around the world and scamming banks. So the question at that point was why are three black guys charged and why are the white guys who put them together not charged, okay? So there was clearly a racial issue in the case. I chose not to raise it at all. I actually had some meetings in South Los Angeles uh, with some black activists who wanted to bring busloads of people to R Rancho Cucamonga, which is in Santa Br San Bernardino County where the trial took place, and I said, don't. I said, I'm familiar with the jury pool. It's going to be predominantly white. I don't want to do anything that I think might hurt our defense. We're going to win this case without raising a racial issue, even though it's there. And after an 11-week trial, the judge, who was the presiding judge in that courthouse, said he was going to do something he had never done in his career. He was not going to let it get to the jury. He was going to dismiss it in the interest of justice. And he did. So there's an example where there's clear evidence of racism, but you don't raise it because your primary goal is save your client's life. Now the Michael Jackson case. If you listen to the media in the Michael Jackson case, you would say to yourself that this community where the case was tried, Santa Maria, in the city of Santa Maria in Santa Barbara County, California, which is north of Los Angeles, it's between Los Angeles and San Francisco. If you listen to the media, you would have to conclude that this jury was composed of white rednecks who were ready to string up Michael Jackson without a trial. That's what you'd have to conclude. And it was absolutely false. It was absolutely false. This is a community where Michael Jackson chose to live. There were very few African Americans in the community. It was primarily white and Latino. And it's known to be a very conservative community. White collar, conservative, but also with a strong libertarian streak. And even the prosecution before the trial began made a motion in limine that we not be allowed to refer to them as the government in our defense. And that was denied, and as you can imagine, I periodically pointed at the government prosecutors in my defense. Well, I got up there early, and I had never tried a case in San Bernardino County. And I'd put my jeans on and just hang out in some bars and restaurants, nothing fancy, usually by myself, to see what happened. And invariably, somebody would figure out who I was, because it was a big case in that community, and they would start talking to me. And what I discovered, at least in terms of my limited you know, experiences of that sort, which were usually mid-afternoon, early evening, was that Michael Jackson was extremely popular in that community. White people, Latino people, young, middle-aged, old children loved Michael. He was their celebrity. He could have lived anywhere in the world. He had chosen their community. He had done kind things for people in that community. When the Air Force wanted to use Neverland to do a film, he said, come on in. He had waiting lists of kids, primarily disadvantaged kids, who wanted to come to Neverland for a day with the amusement park and with the zoo. And even though not everybody liked him, a lot of people did. Now, I had a jury consultant, and she did what jury consultants always do, and that is they conduct surveys and focus groups, and they obtain data and they correlate data. They'll get your age and your occupation and your political affiliation, your religion, your race, and they will associate it with various attitudinal issues, and they'll come up with a typical profile of what a pro-prosecution juror would be and what a pro-defense juror would be. And had I listened to that data, which the prosecution had as well, probably wouldn't have done as well. Because, among other things, that data said that women with kids are probably your worst jurors. It's a child molestation case. Mothers are, want to protect their children, and this is the worst kind of thing you can do. And frankly, women with kids were what I wanted. Because jury surveys, hard data, this kind of analysis is no substitute for your intuition, for your feelings about people, for your understanding about who your client is and who might be open to understanding your client, 
for your intuitions and your instincts about who might look at the prosecution witnesses and see through them if you really think you represent the truth, and I'm convinced we did. And I said to myself, race is not going to be an issue in this case. Now, Michael and his family were concerned about no African Americans on the jury. We had one African American alternate who never made it to the actual panel. I was not concerned. The more I learned about the community, the more I learned about my case, the more I learned about the client, the more I sensed what I thought about this courthouse and what had happened in the past in this courthouse, the more I really thought we're going to get a fair shake. And I'll tell you something else. I learned, as I said before, I'd never tried a case in Santa Barbara County, but I learned that there's somewhat of an attitudinal split between the North County and the South County. As I said before, Santa Maria is in the North County, which is primarily blue collar, working class, very conservative. The South County, thought to be more affluent and more liberal. You have the University of California at Santa Barbara in the South. You have the district attorney's principal office in the South. There had been two bills I discovered introduced in the state legislature trying to get the North to secede from the South. And I said to myself, you know, this is Michael's community. He chose it. People like him. Let's position Michael and his community against this vindictive DA from the South. And I think it was effective because I also learned that most people in that community thought the DA was on a vendetta to get Michael Jackson. He had convened a grand jury in the early 90s to try and get an indictment and he had failed. The grand jury met for approximately six months and would not charge Michael Jackson with anything. And I have since spoken to someone who was on that grand jury quite recently from Los Angeles. She was on a Los Angeles grand jury that was convened at the same time and they had real problems with these accusations and real problems with a sense that people were trying to get money out of Michael Jackson by generating these charges. So he failed to get an indictment in the early 90s. In the mid 90s, the district attorney flew to Australia and Canada. They're the only countries I know that he went to. He may have gone to others looking for victims of Michael Jackson. He failed. They told him to get lost. He didn't do anything to us. He had a website at the Sheriff's Department looking for information on Michael Jackson and finally got the case that you know about because it was tried this year. And as Professor Ogletree said, 10 felony counts, not guilty, four lesser included misdemeanor counts, not guilty. Didn't even hang him on misdemeanors. The case, in my opinion, was a total fraud. It was an effort by unscrupulous prosecutors and police to do anything they could and say anything they could say to try and get a conviction on a single count. And it was absolutely unjust what was done to Michael Jackson this year. But my conclusion on the issue of race, I told people who I had the ability to talk to about the issue the following. I said to African American people, Michael Jackson is black. He is black. If you ask him what his race is, he's black. But you know, to a lot of white people, Michael Jackson transcends race. He brings people together. We played tapes to the jury where he talked about why he loves people on all continents, people of all races. He said at one point, I wish I could adopt a child from every continent. He talked about how he dislikes racism and dislikes bigotry. And I am absolutely convinced that that jury saw Michael Jackson as someone who brings people together, not apart. And I never had a concern about these jurors being fair. I just didn't. I always thought this jury would never ally with the DA because it was their county. I never thought so. I never thought this jury would penalize Michael Jackson because he has long care, because he has a serious skin condition which I have witnessed. It's called vitiligo. He has shown me his skin. If you look at the, his back, you will see brown patches and white patches. It's changing and eating pigment in his skin. He's very embarrassed with that. He chose to put white makeup on his face rather than have these splotches all over his face. That's his choice. I don't think it's a crime to do that. And the media kept portraying him as so weird and so strange. And I would say to people, turn on the TV any night and look at people who are stranger than Michael Jackson. He is creative. He dances to his own drummer. On a tape we played to the jury, he said, you know, you like to go to ball games. I like to sit in my tree and make music. Yes, he's different. Yes, he's a musical genius. Yes, he's had his problems. 
yes, he's a human being, and no, he's not a criminal. So these are three examples where you had to first identify whether there was a racial component 